Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. In one of my previous videos, I discussed a theory put forward by Professor Ivan Watkins that states that the ancient people of the world were able to cut stone by harnessing the power of the sun. Many, including myself, do not believe that simple tools were enough to create some of the truly wondrous ancient stone monuments seen on just about every continent of the world, from Machu Picchu in South America to the Giza Plateau in Egypt. There is a body of thought that strongly believes that ancient aliens are responsible, but I've never seen any credible evidence to believe such a theory. Of course, you can interpret ancient writings, images and structures in a number of different ways, but I believe there was once a far more advanced civilization that collapsed at the end of the last ice age, the remnants of which became scattered around the world. One thing is for sure, certain ancient monuments do show advanced methods of stonework, but I believe that it wasn't due to the use of electricity and power tools, but a more efficient technology that harnessed natural forces such as the sun, wind, water or sound. The technology has not been recorded in history, but if natural forces were harnessed, there wouldn't be much evidence recorded in the archaeological record, apart from the product of that technology, which is what we see in the form of perfectly drilled granite, intricate diorite vases and perfectly fitting irregular stone walls. You can't just drill or shape stone in the way you can wood or metal, especially hard stones like granite or diorite, as they are made from extremely hard interlocking minerals that wear down tools before any real progress can even be made. The ancient stone and metal tools that we are told were used would have very little impact on hard igneous rocks, so archaeology is certainly missing something. In the modern age, it takes diamond-tipped tools and lots of cooling fluid to achieve the feats of stone masonry that we see in the distant past, and even now it is a relatively slow and difficult process. Which brings us to another theory for how they achieved it, by harnessing the power of sound. Tuning forks, vibrations, sonic drilling and acoustic levitation are all ways that sound can be utilised for technological gain and are all scientifically feasible using not just modern but ancient methods and materials. So how does sonic drilling work? Well, in simple terms, when sound vibrations of a specific frequency are sent through a drill bit, or even through something as simple as a metal pipe, it can vibrate in such a way to act like a very high frequency jackhammer. The drill barely needs to turn, as the vibrational impacts and shattering do the job. Compared to conventional drilling, the method is actually faster, puts less wear on the tool bit and takes less energy. Conceivably, you can even turn the handle of a large tuning fork into a cutting rod, whether a drill tube or a drill bit. Even a copper tube could conceivably cut into granite using this method. To turn a tuning fork into a sonic drill, the resonant frequency of the cutting rod must match the frequency of the fork that is attached to it. Scientifically, the way it works is that traverse vibrations from the fork prongs, known as tines, move the bottom of the U-shape up and down, which sends longitudinal vibrations through the cutting rod. At the rod's resonant frequency, these vibrations create standing waves, with maximum vibration at the beginning and the end of the rod, and there is a point of no vibration in the middle where a handle could be attached. For example, tines 30cm long and 3cm thick make a resonant frequency of 1100 Hz and would require a 1.5m long rod to allow cutting, as pictured here. Notice how long the rod is relative to the fork and how it actually looks like a trident or harpoon. It could even function as such if the tines were sharpened. In Egyptian mythology, the falcon god Horus is associated with harpoons, but maybe the clearest evidence for sonic drilling has been staring us in the face for millennia. One common symbol or object that is seen so often in ancient Egyptian art is the scepter. It appears in relics, art and hieroglyphs associated with the ancient Egyptian religion. Known as the Was scepter, 
it is a long, straight staff with a forked end. The opposite end is sometimes seen to be a stylized animal head, but maybe this is actually a cutting implement. The scepter was a symbol of power and dominion, and although it has a number of other mythological and symbolic associations, maybe the true meaning got lost through the dynastic history of ancient Egypt. What became a symbol of power maybe once was literally an object of power. But mainstream historians and archaeologists attest that traditional stone and metal tools were used to create stone blocks and ornaments. And this is all because of depictions of the art of stoneworking in wall reliefs from the 5th dynasty all the way up to the 26th dynasty. But for a start, when you analyse drilled granite, it is clear that these methods certainly did not create the boreholes. When you look at the holes that do not go all the way through the granite, the circumference of the circular hole has a deeper groove, implying it was created with a metal pipe. And it wouldn't be possible to cut into granite simply using a metal pipe, sand and manual labour, as we are led to believe. What's the problem here? There's no, you know, without a steady stream of water, you're not getting new material in there to do the cutting action. You're not getting rid of the old powder, which is just interfering with the drill going down. But you can cut granite efficiently and quickly with a metal pipe if you use sonic drilling methods. In ancient Egyptian images, we do see the use of simple hand tools to make stone vases and bowls, but such a method, even in conjunction with sand, wouldn't be able to efficiently grind stone such as granite or diorite, and create the striations or tool marks that we see inside drilled Egyptian artefacts. Furthermore, the most amazing and most difficult stonework created from the hardest stones are usually Old Kingdom, predating the 5th dynasty and many were actually pre-dynastic. There is no doubt that the stonework from the 5th dynasty onwards could have been created from the simple stone tool shown, as the rock used to make such artefacts was usually softer, such as alabaster, sandstone and limestone. The oldest depiction of a rock drill is a hieroglyph known as U24 in Gardner's 1957 guide. This is first seen in a 3rd dynasty tomb at Saqqara. Maybe the hieroglyph is actually depicting a tuning fork tool, and not a depiction of a traditional hand crank rock drill, as we are told. Some researchers believe they have found ancient Egyptian carvings of two tuning forks attached by wires on a statue of Isis and Anubis, shown here. This is one way you could get them to resonate to a specific frequency for a prolonged amount of time to cut stone, without hitting them with a hammer. Interestingly, on the website, keelinet.com, there is an email that was sent to the website that stated, Do you know about the tuning forks which were discovered by Egyptologists who, presumably, because they were unable to ascribe a utility to these items, deemed them to be anomalous? Some years ago, an American friend picked the lock of a door leading to an Egyptian museum storeroom. Inside, she found hundreds of what she described as tuning forks. These ranged in size from approximately 8 inches to approximately 8 or 9 feet overall, and resembled catapults, but with a taut wire stretched between the tines of the fork. She insists, incidentally, that these were definitely non-ferrous, but steel. These objects resembled a letter U with a handle, a bit like a pitchfork, and when the wire was plucked, they vibrated for a prolonged period. It occurs to me to wonder if these devices might have had hardened tool bits attached to the bottom of the handles, and if they might have been used for cutting or engraving stone, once they had been set vibrating. Of course, I have no way of verifying this email that was actually sent in 1997, but it is certainly interesting in that it confirms the carving on the statue of Isis and Anubis of two tuning forks connected by wires. There is also this image from a Sumerian cylinder seal showing a musical scene and a musician is clearly seen holding a tuning fork. 
The technology, I'm sure, is ancient and not an 18th century invention as we are led to believe. Whatever the truth, independent researchers have proved that you can bore holes through solid rock with copper tubing using sonic drilling methods. And with new research into ancient megalithic sites across the world, we are finding out that acoustics were widely understood by the ancients and were certainly taken into account when building stone structures. This relatively new line of archaeological research is known as archaeoacoustics and is observed at sites such as Stonehenge in England, Adam's Calendar in South Africa and Gebekli Tepe in Turkey, not to mention the Great Pyramid of Egypt. They all share unquestionable acoustic properties that could well have amplified sound waves to vibrate forked tools at a constant pitch and allow the seemingly advanced method of stone cutting that has eluded historical researchers for so long. Thank you for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. Please subscribe to the channel, please like this video and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.